The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. You will hear a number of different recordings. You will have time to read the questions before each recording and time at the end of each recording to check your answers. The recordings will be played once only. Part 1 You will hear a conversation between a customer and a receptionist at a car rental agency. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning. How can I help you? Hello. Is this Southern Rental Car? Yes, it is. I wonder if you could help me. I'm ringing from Nelson, but I'm coming over to Auckland for 12 days and I'd like to hire a car. OK, I'll fill in a booking for you now. First, can I take your name? Yes, it's William Waddell. Sorry, could you spell your surname? Uh, yes, it's W-A-D-D-E-L-L. -L. Thanks. Now, can I have an address and phone number? Sure. I live at 10 Robin Place. That's R-O-B-Y-N Place. And that's Nelson, isn't it? That's right. Do you want my home number or my mobile? Home number will be fine. OK. It's 7 263 Great. Now, can I also have a credit card number? Do I have to pay by credit card? Well, we need a credit card number as a guarantee. It's a standard policy for car rentals. OK, well, I'll pay by visa then. The card number is... 4550-1392-8309-3221. And the expiry date? Sorry? Your card. When does it expire? Oh, next July. Right. Now, how long did you want the car for? 12 days, did you say? No, I only need a car for 10 days, from the 2nd to the 11th of next month. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you will have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, what type of car are you looking to hire? Well, I'm not too worried about the model of the car, but I understand that you have rental cars from just $25 a day. Is that correct? We do sometimes have the $25 deals, but only in the low season. For the period you are looking at, the cheapest we have is $35. However, that price includes unlimited kilometres. Sorry, did you say unlimited kilometres? What does that mean exactly? That means that no matter how far you go, the cost is the same. Some companies charge for rental and then charge again for every kilometre you actually drive. Well, I am going to be travelling quite long distances. I'm visiting relatives and they live quite far apart from each other. So unlimited kilometres are probably a good idea. If you're travelling long distances, you would be better off with an automatic. Changing gears in a manual can make it more expensive on petrol. OK, I'll take the automatic then. Right. So that's an automatic car for 10 days from the 2nd to the 11th. That's all booked. Is there anything else I can help you with? No, that's fine. Oh, sorry, what do I need to bring with me when I pick up the car? All you need is your driving licence. Right. Well, thanks very much. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute 
to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of an introductory talk on nutrition. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Good afternoon. Many people in the Western world eat the wrong food, and they eat far too much of it. So, the topic of my lecture today is healthy eating. I'll divide my talk into three parts. Firstly, I'm going to define what I mean by healthy eating. After that, I'll go on to talk about why people don't eat properly, and then I'll finish my lecture with some ideas for improving the situation. Right. So, what do I mean by healthy eating? Well, some people might think it means eating a lot of meat. Um, of course, vegetarians wouldn't agree with this. They think eating meat is very unhealthy. Other people think that eating a lot of cabbage is good for you, or a lot of salad. Well, naturally, cabbage, salad and meat can all be part of healthy eating. But for me, healthy eating means two things. One is eating a balanced diet, and the other is eating the right amount of food. In my opinion, a balanced diet means eating a variety of foods, including meat, vegetables, fruit, cereals and dairy foods. Obviously, the amount of food we should eat is more difficult to decide. It depends a lot on how active we are. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Now on to my next point. Why do so many people eat badly? Well, let's look first at having a balanced diet. To have a balanced diet, you have to plan your meals in advance and then buy the right food and then take time to cook it properly. But these days, people are so busy working that they don't have time to go shopping. So they end up buying fast food at the last minute. Another reason people don't eat well nowadays is that it's actually cheaper to buy food already prepared in a packet. So people who haven't got much money will buy packet food rather than cook something fresh. And a final reason why people don't eat healthily is that they don't know how to. In my opinion, schools don't do nearly enough to educate their pupils in healthy eating habits. And now to my third and last point. What can we do to solve the problem? Well, I think it can be solved by three main groups. Families, schools and the government. To start with, parents should make sure their children have a healthy diet. Secondly, a lot of schools have self-service machines where their pupils can buy soft drinks, crisps, sweets and chocolates. 
I think schools should change what they sell in these machines. Another thing schools can do is make sure that the food they serve in their canteens is fresh and well balanced. And to finish, I'll briefly mention two of the measures I think the government should take to encourage healthy eating. One is to limit advertising unhealthy food, and the other is to spend more money on educating the public about the benefits of a healthy diet. In my next lecture, I'll go into more detail about them. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between two design students and their tutor on a practical assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. So, have you chosen a product yet? I think so. We'd like to build a gyroscopic exercise aid. Sounds interesting. Tell me more. Well,、uh, we did some research and were amazed to discover the sheer range of applications for gyroscopic technology. Gyroscopes are used in laser and optical devices, and can be found in many consumer appliances too. Right. Tell me about this product specifically, though. The aim of the assignment is to create something practical, functional, and beneficial for consumers. Justify your decision. Well, we believe we can design and build a cheap and effective muscle strengthening aid. By taking advantage of the inertial forces created by a gyroscope. Yes, what we want to do is design a ball which can be held in the palm. Within the ball, there will be a simple gyroscope. This gyroscope can be set in motion by movement of the lower arm and wrist together in sync. The device will not require any external power source because it will be sustained by the movement of the arm and wrist. This will create considerable resistance and an excellent lower arm strengthening aid. It will be simple to design and cheap to produce, yet extremely effective. This all sounds very good. I'm impressed. Thanks, Mark. We're glad you like it. I think we're really onto something here. Our research has told us there's nothing comparable in the market, and that a product like this would have multiple uses. Not only could it be used as an everyday toning and exercise device, it could also be beneficial to people in rehabilitation who have suffered serious lower arm injuries. We see the product being marketed towards high-performance athletes, like tennis and golf players, for whom lower arm strength is vital too. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. I've heard enough to give your project the go-ahead. Now, let's talk costs. Right. Well, we estimate that around £3,000 will be required for product development. You mean to build the prototype? Exactly. And we'll need half that again to carry out some product testing. And what's your timeline for the project? Mm, the prototype should be ready a fortnight after work on the design starts, and we'll need another six weeks for testing. We want to enlist the help of 15 people to test the prototype. Ideally, we want five professional athletes to try it out, five recovery patients, and the remainder of the subjects will be gym members, our three target markets. OK. Well, you have a lot of work to do, but you've certainly made a good start. Let's meet again on Monday to get the ball rolling. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk about the tall ships race in Britain. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In July 1956, a fleet of 21 sailing ships from 11 countries raced each other from Torbay in Devon to Lisbon. The ships had been converted from cargo carrying to sail training ships. However, their future seemed uncertain and the purpose of the gathering was to mark the passing of the age of the sail. What happened instead was that the sailing ships refused to say goodbye, and two years later they raced again, and the fleet was even larger. It was then that the title The Tall Ships was given to them, and the name remains today. The original organisers, the Sail Training Ship International Race Committee, now called the Sail Training Association, saw that a new international movement had begun, adventure training under sail. As race succeeded race, it became clear that the events had more to do with bringing adventure and widening the horizons of young people than of commemorating the passing of sail. Now, sail training ships began to be specially built and young people from all walks of life wanted to participate. Now, to compete, a vessel has to satisfy just three requirements. It has to have a minimum waterline length of 9.09 metres. Half its crew must be between the ages of 16 and 25, and its principal means of propulsion must be a sail. Since 1972, the race has been sponsored by Cutty Sark Scott's Whiskey and it has started to attract huge crowds of spectators. In 1984, more than 250,000 people lined the River Mersey in Liverpool to watch the fleet set off. And in 1986, two million spectators joined Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth at Newcastle-upon-Tyne to watch the parade. 1989 was the year that the spectacular Cutty Sark Tall Ships Race started from London. A grand fleet of up to 100 vessels gathered on the River Thames, near Tower Bridge, 
on Tuesday, the fourth of July. The only thing that the racing yachts, ancient and modern, had in common was their young crews. Few were expert sailors, and the majorities were strangers to the sea and to each other. Between Tuesday, the fourth of July, when the fleet began to assemble, and Saturday, the eighth of July, when the ships took part in a grand parade of sail down the River Thames, vessels were berthed on either side of Tower Bridge. Some were moored in the Pool of London, opposite the Tower of London, while others were moored to the east of Tower Bridge. Smaller vessels were accommodated in St Catherine's Dock. Many of the larger ships were open to the public. It was an amazing and historic spectacle as the ships sailed slowly up the River Thames. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.